Okay, I don't know what happened here. That was very odd. Okay, hope it does not happen during the presentation. So uh, I guess I can admit to everybody. Yeah. It's 9.58. Yeah, I would go ahead. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Just waiting to get started. All right, it's 10 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to Catalyst Day and to presentations from one of our great Catalyst 300 groups. Um, my name is Becky Matsky. I'm a professor of history, um, and I am joined uh, with, by my uh, co-host, uh, Professor Dominique Poncelet, and we will be your moderators for today, introducing our um, group of students who will give their presentation um, and then we will have some time for question and answer at the end of their presentation. If you have questions as uh, we go through the presentation, um, please go ahead and enter them in the chat and we can address those at the end of the presentation. And uh, we can also take some verbal questions at the end as well. Um, but for now, I will turn it over to our group. Their title of their presentation and their project is E-Waste and the Environment, Solving the Problem at Home. Go ahead. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Adam. My name is John. I'm Bree. I'm Brooke. And today we're going to be talking about electronic waste, what it is, what it does, what the negative impacts are, what people have done to try and solve the electronic waste problem, and what our applied innovation ourselves is to this problem. Electronic waste or e-waste from electronic items such as computers, phones, and other miscellaneous electronic equipment that has reached the end of its useful life. E-waste is one of the fastest growing global problems. In 2016, 44.7 million metric tons of e-waste was generated globally by humans, equivalent to just under 4,500 Eiffel Towers. By 2030, global e-waste generation is projected to reach 74.7 million metric tons, equivalent to 7,390 Eiffel Towers. E-waste generation is increasing from one to 3% annually, or the equivalent of 20 to 50 million tons a year. The US is the second highest contributor to global e-waste, generating 7 million metric tons alone, 3 million metric tons behind China. To dispose of e-waste, it needs to be recycled formally. Certified e-waste uh, recycling centers pick up the waste from consumers, mechanically sort the e-waste, and then either recycle and reuse what is salvageable, or the waste ends up in landfills. 
Of the e-waste that is recycled in the United States, upwards of 80% is handled informally. Informal recycling is recycling in an unmonitored way with unauthorized practices. The 80% of informally handled waste generated by the US in Africa and Asia, where the waste goes through low cost recycling, such as open air burning and dumping, which releases chemical and toxic materials into the environment. Informal recycling methodologies consist of first, physically dismantling and separating the waste by hand. Then certain components are burned over coal fire grills, while others are put into open pit acid baths that don't have proper ventilation. The leftover materials that are not turned over for profit are then disposed of in fields and rivers, which leads to soil, air, and water pollution. A study conducted by Zhang et al. in 2015 found that atmospheric contamination is attributed to the burning of heavy metals such as arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead. These toxic materials were found in the air near e-waste processing plants from 58 to 691 times greater than those in the surrounding areas. A study conducted by Ohajinwa et al. in 2018 found that soil contamination is attributed to high levels of heavy metal found at dismantling sites and burning sites, where the toxic chemicals leach down into the soil particles, contaminating the surrounding area, the water, and fields where local food is grown. A study by Vetrimergen et al. in 2016 found that water contamination is attributed to the dumping of toxic substances that are dissolved and mixed into the water, as well as interacting with contaminated soil. There's a measurable concentration of lead found in water near e-waste plants, about eight times greater than the average of the surrounding areas. Humans breathe in and consume these contaminated materials in the air, soil, and water. In a study conducted by Papula et al. in 2019, was found that one of the largest and deadliest impacts of handling e-waste is increased blood lead levels. In a study conducted at an informal e-waste processing plant, the mean of blood lead level in the study was 11 micrograms of lead per deciliter of blood, exceeding the recommended level of 4.26 micrograms. These high levels of heavy metals in the blood of e-waste scavengers was attributed to the direct contact individuals had with informal e-waste recycling methods. One such survey conducted by the Yava College of Technology inquired about health effects reported by scavengers, some of which included headache, body pain, dizziness, cough, heart pain, stomach, chest pain, heartburn, general weakness, and heart disorders. Other studies reported symptoms including thyroid dysfunction, behavioral changes, decreased lung function, and adverse changes that can be seen at the cellular level. Heavy metals breaching the human body have been found to harm the central nervous system as well. Lead specifically adversely affects the mental health of children and can also harm you the circulatory, renal, and reproductive systems, especially impacting pregnant women who reported an increase of adverse birth outcomes. These health impacts from informal e-waste recycling are only a reported symptoms, which will increase in amount and deadliness as e-waste pollution continues to grow. So some of the solutions that have been utilized to tackle this problem include, um, no, let me do, uh, the first solution here that we're going to talk about too is the Basel Convention. The Basel Convention was a convention signed between the years of 1989 and 1990 with the purpose of three different goals. First goal was reducing the production of harmful and uh, therefore electronic waste. The second one was promoting environmentally friendly disposal methods um, to help the environment in that sense. And the third one was restricting transboundary movements, except when perceived to be environmentally sound. So the electronic waste produced inside a country would stay inside of a country and, and instead of being shipped off to some random place for it to be dealt with elsewhere. This is to keep the uh, electronic waste within people's borders unless it is environmentally sound. The results of this convention is that between the years of 1989 and 1990, 53 countries did sign on to this convention. And since then, over 150 countries have uh, ratified it into their law base. However, uh, three countries, including Afghanistan, Haiti, and the mighty United States, have, although they signed on to it, not ratified it into their law books and thus do not have to follow the tenets of the Basque Convention. This leads to places like the United States still being able to ship their electronic waste 
off to other countries such as China where the detrimental effects such as we talked about happen. The second solution was developed in Greece with the oversight of the UN and was established in 2006. Now this solution, as you can see with the flow chart here on the screen, um, did actually decrease the e-waste contamination overall. However, due to flaws with uh, you know, some of the problems that are in this solution directly, and due to the fact that there is no actual follow-up study, it is not known uh, how well this solution is actually done, what its benefits, trade-offs, and uh, negligence are. This, neg this lack of rigorous study makes it difficult for other countries to attempt to sign on to it because they don't know if it actually works. The last solution is a solution here in Wisconsin, which is called the East Cycle Wisconsin Program. The main goals of the East Cycle Wisconsin Program are also reducing the e-waste production into landfills and, produce, and improving recycling for residents here in Wisconsin. Also to manage the e-waste in a cost-effective manner with the idea of there being little government interventions so that it's kind of the small government idea. The actual results from this eCycle Wisconsin program are 23.5 million pounds of e-waste collected. However, there were also 1.3 million pounds of e-waste lost. This contributes to the difficulty that we've been having where we just can't track a lot of this electronic waste that's being, uh, that has been uh, going on. And also due to the fact that there isn't any statewide pickup with this particular solution, this leads to the um, downfalls that a lot of these solutions directly have. So the shortcomings, starting with the Basel Convention, where we see that the fact that there is um, just ramp, there are gaping loopholes to allow places like the United States to just utilize that to ship their electronic waste off regardless. We have places like Greece where there's no actual direct follow-up study to actually check to see if this solution actually works. And finally, with the eCycle Wisconsin program, we see how there is a, there's no statewide pickup and that leaves, there is also, that leaves um, also situations where there are drop-off fees for certain electronics making it inaccessible for a majority of people living in Wisconsin to be able to utilize the eCycle Wisconsin program. Thusly, we are trying to take the holes from a lot of these previous solutions and combine them to create our more innovations, innovative solution. All right, and now we moved on to the applied innovation section of our, of our presentation. The goal of our applied innovation is to turn e recycling facilities into e-waste capable facilities. And we'll do that by implementing some rules and regulations that the companies will have to follow. We will also be creating a public option that is convenient and free for the residents of Wisconsin in order to decrease on the struggle that is coming from the drop-off fees and the convenience of e-recycling in Wisconsin. So this is going to be a four phase plan and we will go further into all of the phases after this. The first phase is going to be defining proper e-waste guidelines in facilities that they are required to follow if they choose to join on with this program. One of the requirements is that they will provide personal protective equipment or PPE to all of their employees. These items are including gloves, face shields and safety glasses, protective suits, respirators and helmets. The purpose of all of these is to decrease the risk of contamination and injury for employees that are in the recycling facilities. There will also be a requirement to install advanced filtration, specifically air and water filters. This is to decrease air and water pollution along with keeping the employees safe. And finally, they will have to adopt the shred, sort, and separate method, which will be further described in the next slide. The shred sort separate method is a three-step method that we have established as the primary use for our e-waste capable facilities. As you can see, there is a fourth element added in there and we will go over that once we get to it. So the first step in the 3S method is to shred, which is a manual breakdown of the e-waste, which is then followed by mechanical sorting. Next up is sorting. So we have to sort through the sort through the materials based on their properties using mechanical and chemical procedures. An example of this is taking a large magnet and hovering it over 
all of the shredded e-waste and collecting all of the metals that can come from it. The third step is to separate the materials. So that will be the extraction of the raw materials that are left over along with proper disposal of the leftover products such as plastic. And finally, the fourth element, which is an additional element that we have added is to sell. We will be selling back the raw materials that are collected from the e-waste recycling and they will be provided back into the circulation. So the benefits of this method is that there is a standardized method, which means that we can better track and manage our e-waste. There also will be job creations because we need more people on, with hands-on experience in order to properly dispose of the e-waste. Furthermore, we will also decrease pollution and increase the human health benefits that can come from it as that pollution isn't getting into our lungs or our digestive systems and plus our environment will be healthier. And finally, it benefits a circular economy by reselling all of those raw materials back in. All right, I'm gonna go over phase two of, the, of our solution here. And phase two is going to have two sub phases which are gonna be enacted simultaneously. So the first sub phase we'll call phase 2A it involves a collection of e-waste. So with our system, we're going to be adding a third bin in addition to the recycling bin and trash bin you already have at your house. And this bin will be specifically for e-waste, uh, including like computers, laptops, batteries, really anything with a plug, battery, or cord that is no longer needed or wanted can be put in our bin. So this, um, this collection will be free by the existing services, existing uh, collection services, such as like waste management or advanced disposal. The collection will be subsidized based on the tonnage of e-waste these companies collect. And they'll be subsidized a set amount based on the amount of e-waste collected here. So phase 2B of our solution will involve the subsidizing of e-waste recycling in pre-existing e-waste facilities. So these pre-existing e-waste facilities such as one similar to ERI Direct uh, will, be, will be, if they want to adopt our solution, they can, they will have to integrate our phase one guidelines into their existing company. Uh, with if they do this, they will be subsidized based on the tonnage of e-waste that they recycle every year. And then every year they will have a yearly audit by e-waste recycling auditors, which already are existing in Wisconsin, which will make sure that they're, uh, that they're, uh, they are doing this in accordance to our guidelines and are getting the correct amount of subsidy. So you might ask, where will this money come from? Well, we're actually going to be reallocating funds that are already collected from, e from electronics manufacturers. So this is by this Wisconsin statue that's on screen right now. So this, what it does is it collects registration fees for manufacturers for electronic covered devices. So anything that's created that's um, covered in electronic, uh, it will be, it could, they uh, they get registration. They have to pay registration fees based on how many they sell. So if they sell more than twenty five, they pay a certain amount, and they pay if they do more than two hundred and fifty, they pay a certain amount. And then this money can be reallocated to our project here. All right, so phase three of our plan is going to be transforming e-waste, the current recycling facilities into e-waste capable facilities. So how we're going to do this is we're going to be talking with existing recycling centers such as waste management, advanced disposal or John's disposal services. And we'll be laying out the format in which we need them to follow the guidelines that we laid out in phase one. If they agree, they will be benefited with subsidies by a tonnage of e-waste recycled as John previously mentioned. And just to check in, we will be doing yearly recycling audits with them with the pre-existing e-waste recycling auditors that are provided by the state. And phase four of our plan is going to be for potential future improvements. So 
In this phase, we'll be fixing problems that arise in other phases. Uh, so this might include like switching our collection vehicles to e-vehicles to reduce the amount of carbon emissions that they, they produce, which would be uh, a problem. Uh, the also part of our phase four is going to include the spreading of our initiative to other states in hopes that eventually this will become a nationwide solution to e-waste. There we go, I apologize. So the resources that are required and the stakeholders for these phases are going to be laid out as follows. For phase one, the largest resource that is necessary is time. We need time to establish the system and ensure that it will work. And the stakeholders are team third bin, which is us. So phase one is already complete. As we move on to phase two A, the resources that are going to be required are a third bin and how we're going to distribute them. And the stakeholders are going to be existing waste collection agencies that are willing to work with us. For phase 2B, the resources are a little more hefty. However, it is generally one-time purchases in relation to the new machinery and advanced filtration systems, with the only real requirement after that being general maintenance. PPE is going to be a needs to be updated type of thing based on the employees. The subsidy capital, um, as John previously stated, we're going to try and reallocate the funds from the chapter within the Wisconsin legislature in order to cover that. The stakeholders are going to be the existing e-waste companies and the e-waste auditors. As we continue on, phase three, the resources are actually going to be the same as in phase 2B. So we don't necessarily need to go over those again. And then the stakeholders are going to be the current recycling companies that want to work with us and will become future e-waste capable companies. And for phase four, that is to be determined. Um, the reason for this is that phase four is made purely to fix any of the problems that come up in the previous three phases. And the stakeholders are going to be the e-waste recycling companies that already exist, the e-waste capable companies that we have begun to work with, the e-waste collection companies, along with legislatures from other states in order to try and spread our initiative. All right, so you might ask, why will this work? So subsidies are proven to work in the past um, because they provide an incentive for companies to do a certain action. So you can see this with corn subsidies uh, that as an example of something that's worked in the past. Uh, the, our solution eliminates the cost of e-waste recycling for e-waste companies. And also, as the recycling increases, the costs are going to decrease as a result of the sunk costs decreasing. Uh, the expense of, of collection is eliminated for consumers, which is important because that solves one of the problems we found before. Uh, it's a lot more convenient if they follow our plan just because we will be collecting the e-waste for free. Our yearly audits will allow for us to make sure we know where the e-waste stream is going. Uh, and the Overall, the reduction in informal e-waste recycling will occur as a result of our solution, just because we will be recycling more things formally and providing an incentive for that. All right, so some of the impacts and new harms that are come from going to come from our applied innovation, actually most of them are benefiting. So the first one is going to be that we're decreasing air, soil, and water pollution by better maintaining and containing e-waste which by result will decrease the negative impacts on human health. As Bree stated earlier, contamination is a big problem and can cause a lot of issues. And so this will allow for those issues to decrease. Also, we'll have better tracking of e-waste. A large proportion of e-waste actually goes untracked. And so this will allow us to better maintain and track where the e-waste is going. Also, we can reuse the raw materials because they aren't in an endless supply, they are depleting, they are natural resources. And this also benefits a circular economy because we can reintroduce the same materials over and over again. Also, it will create new jobs. According to an EPA REI study, it was found that for every 1000 tons of e-waste that is recycled, a possible 1.57 jobs can be created. So as Adam stated earlier, in the state of Wisconsin in 2019, we were able to recycle 23.5 million pounds of e-waste, which would estimate out to about 18,500 new possible jobs if this 
if this applied innovation is implemented. Unfortunately, one of the costs and harms that comes with this is that it, there is going to be a chance of an increased carbon footprint. However, with the phase four adoption of the East E vehicles that will be used for collection, we hopefully can decrease that overall. So I know we're a little over our time here, but just to do a quick wrap up, uh, electronic waste is a detrimental problem to both environmental and human health. There have been several solutions to try and solve this. However, some solutions have gaping legislative loopholes or do not have adequate uh, follow-up studies to see if they work or do not have uh, adequate accessibility for all people who are in the respective area. Our applied innov uh, innovation tries to solve those by getting it accessible to as many people, by have auditors to make sure our systems are in place and are actually working and to make sure that the electronic waste is kept within our borders to be produced in, you know, in our country, in Wisconsin, and to be for us and not be shipped away. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for listening and we can go on to questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam, Bree, John, and Brooklyn. Questions for the group. Looks like we do have a question in the chat. How will compliance by citizens be enforced? Current recycling sorting by households is not followed 100%. How much compliance would be needed to make your plan work? Uh, thank you, that's a great question. Um, the situation here is that the more compliance and that there is, the better it is for the uh, recycling companies that are gonna be handling this. So there'll be incentive on that side because our subsidies for uh, the companies to do this is based on the amount of e-waste that is actually recycled. And then I'll hand it over to either John or Brooklyn to extend on that answer if they want. Yep, so actually the um, compliance with the citizens, the purpose of the third bin is to make it as easy as possible for citizens to recycle their electronic waste. The third bin is the path of least resistance because as you can see, it's very hard for people to justify paying $25 to drop off a TV to be recycled. And so this will allow for an easier way to do it. Plus, if you think about it, how many electronic devices do you have just sitting in your drawers because you don't know where to properly take them? So this will help with that issue as well. Thanks. Other questions for the group? I have a question and that is about the funding. Um, I think this part of the solution was to collect fees um, by from manufacturers based on the number of products they sold. One, I think you said those are already collected. And then if that's the case, then if they're going, those fees are gonna be used to subsidize this operation, that means whatever those fees are used for now would uh, not get them. And so can you talk about from whom those fees are being taken operationally and how that's gonna work out? Yeah, so um, actually in the state legislature, in the statute that we stated specifically, chapter 287, section 17, it doesn't say specifically where the funds are going. And so unfortunately we couldn't track it that far. Um, however, there is a possibility that we could earn over $16,000 from one manufacturer alone because of the fees and registrations that are required for each unit. And so unfortunately, I can't 100% answer your question, but I can just provide a little bit more information about where the funds will come from and um, exactly the amount that will be provided. Thank you. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, we do have a new uh, session from a different group starting at 1030. So uh, one more question from anyone. Um, here's a question in the chat. Have you shared your ideas with anyone else before today? And what did they think of your plan? So this actually was not our initial applied innovation. Our initial applied innovation was to actually build the new waste recycling facility ourselves. Um, however, Professor Keynes pointed out to us that that was a little far reaching. And so we haven't shared anyone this idea with anyone else today outside of Ribbon College. Um, Hopefully though, there is a chance that something similar to this could be applied in the future to the state of Wisconsin in order to help with the e-waste management system. Thank you. I hope that all of you will join me in thanking our group for their presentation today. Well done, everyone.
thank you all for attending. I encourage you to listen in on some of the other Catalyst 300 presentations. You can find all of the links on the Ripon College website. Uh, there's another one starting at 1030. So again, thank you very much to our group and everyone have a good Catalyst day.